Thank you for joining me again everyone and I'm going to start this week with a little bit of business. True Crime Fix is now on Patreon. If you would like to know more please visit www.patreon.com forward slash true crime fix podcast that is www.patreon.com forward slash true crime fix podcast if you do you'll be able to get your fix a little bit earlier just like ash ryan sarah and Kay, who are my first four supporters thank you for your assistance in keeping this podcast going and free for the masses so that is www.patreon.com forward slash true crime fix podcast and now on to this week's episode hi there i'm the host of a new true crime podcast called dark dark world with dark dark world we explore lesser known killers and crimes stories that have slipped between the cracks of the mainstream true crime consciousness my name is jordan crittenden join me as i explore this dark dark world by subscribing to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Hey everyone, it's Jen. And this is Lindsay. And we're the hosts of Corpus Delicti. If true crime is your thing, it's ours too. And we do it with a dash of lightheartedness and a hint of southern charm. We cover both well and lesser known cases and have also started a series where we spend weeks at a time covering cases from certain topics. Ever wondered why there are so many cruise ship deaths and disappearances? How about how crime has affected history? What about lesser-known serial killers? Corpus Delicti has you covered. Episodes are released every Tuesday and can be found on your favorite podcatcher. That's C-O-R-P-U-S-D-E-L-I-C-T-I. Hope you'll join us soon. You've heard the stories of bloody murder and horrendous homicide. But what about the rest of the crimes people fall victim to every day? What about the burglar who broke into famous people's homes? What happened to the forensic chemist that falsified evidence? Who are the fraudsters, arsonists, stalkers, hackers, and more? I'm Lindsay, the host of Mugshot. Mugshot is a true crime podcast bringing you stories of the non-murderous crimes you didn't know you needed to hear. Be sure to find Mugshot on your favorite podcatcher and on all social media outlets at the handle at MugshotPod. But until then, Stay out of trouble, or you may end up pictured in your very own mugshot. True Crime Fix is a podcast with adult themes and graphic descriptions of crime which may not be considered suitable for all ages. Please use your discretion when listening. All research has been conducted using material in the public domain and some opinions may not be that of the author or the host. Please remember that all victims are someone's loved one and all episodes are recorded in the utmost respect of their memory. You're listening to the True Crime Base Podcast with your host, Steve. Hello again everyone, and thank you again for joining me on what is our 14th case together. Please, before we get started, if you've liked the show so far, remember to subscribe on your chosen podcast directory, and all of the new episodes will download automatically for you upon release. I must start this show, however, with a request that you please bear with me. Due to the nature of this case, there is a number of French place names which I've tried to get phonetically spelt out for me, but I know I'll still struggle with some of them. When researching this case, I really thought to myself about how we legitimately take modern day technology for granted, but back in the mid 90s, things that we rely on nowadays could literally have been the difference between life and death. Ladies and gentlemen, This is your True Crime Fix. I'm your host, Steve, and this case has been dedicated to the memory of Céline Figa. 
She was born Celine Marie Therese Figa on the 23rd of May 1976 in Boussançon in France. She was the daughter of Martine and Bernard Figa. She had two brothers, Stéphane and Nicolas. She also had a sister, Corinne. Bissonson is a city in eastern France near the border of Switzerland. The city lies on the Doubs River and has its own historic charms from its 18th century facades to its sloping rooftops. The family lived on a farm one hour north in a little village called ferrier le say Celine had light brown hair and brown eyes. She was also described as polite and articulate. In the summer of 1990, after a visit to England, Celine fell in love with the country to the extent that she made it her mission to learn the English language fluently. Over the next few years, she would travel there frequently, taking in as much of the country as she could. By 1995, Celine had started studying accountancy at Lycée Le Grand Chenois in the city of Montbéliard, which is 54 miles east of her hometown. In the summer of 1995, her cousin Jean-Marc had got a job as a head waiter in the town of Fordingbridge, which is in the county of Hampshire near the New Forest National Park. Jean-Marc managed to get work at the Ashbourne Hotel and Celine jumped at the chance to live in England and get the opportunity to improve her language skills. She loved the work and when it was time to return to her studies she had already made arrangements to return there again in December and spend her Christmas break there. Celine left home on Monday the 18th of December 1995 to start the long journey to England. I say the long journey because of where she lived and where she was going in 1995 were not connected by international airports. Her journey, which she had planned with her parents, was to travel with a family friend who had an international haulage company to the French coastal town of Calais, a journey of over 450 miles and would have taken nine hours to complete. The following day, she would cross the English Channel by ferry and arrive at the port of Dover. She would then be taken 23 miles to the Kent town of Ashford, where she would take the train into London and back south to Brockenhurst, which was close to her destination, a journey, if she made all the connections seamlessly, that would have taken four and a half hours. As planned, Celine met up with family friend Guy Mallow in Nouvelle La La Charette and they departed for Calais at 3 p.m. The first part of the journey went without a hitch, but instead of getting the ferry, they took the Eurotunnel. The Eurotunnel is a train service which acts as a transporter to cars and lorries under the 31 mile long English Channel at 99 miles per hour. They were therefore in the Kent town of Folkestone within 25 minutes of departure, arriving at about one o'clock in the afternoon. This is where the plans changed a little. Rather than transporting Celine to Ashford so that she can continue her journey by train, Guy met a fellow long distance haulage driver, Roger Bouvier, who was willing to take her to Cheveley services near the town of Newbury in Berkshire and she could then arrange for her cousin Jean-Marc to collect her and continue the final 50 miles of her journey. Upon arrival at the services at about 4pm, she attempted to call Jean-Marc to come out and collect her, but she had written the telephone number down incorrectly. Due to an increased number of subscribers wanting a landline telephone on the 16th of April 1995, the UK went live with a change of area code, predominantly adding a 1 to the area code. For example, lines around London, which had been 081, became 0181. And specifically in Celine's case, 
all of the numbers in the Southampton area had changed from 0703 to 01703. As a result, she was unable to get in touch with him. Fearing that Celine was going to be stranded, Roger assisted her trying to get a lift nearer to her desired destination. They were in luck, as after overhearing their conversation with another man, they were approached by the driver of a white Mercedes lorry who offered a lift to the Cathedral City of Salisbury on his way to Southampton, Salisbury being 11 miles away from the hotel where her cousin was working. Reluctant to allow Celine to travel with the stranger, but not seeing much other option, Roger agreed for Celine to go with the driver. The weather that afternoon was particularly cold and darkness was falling as they left at 4.30pm. The driver reassured Roger that he would lend Celine the phone in his cab and get her to Salisbury in time for the 8pm bus to Fordingbridge. Celine bid au revoir to Roger and climbed aboard the vehicle, a predominant sticker reading No Fear on the side of the cab door as she closed it behind her and then the lorry pulled out of the service station to start its journey south. When Celine did not arrive at the hotel that evening, the following day a panicked John Mark called Bernard and Martin at their farm in France. On the advice of colleagues at the hotel, the police were contacted. Upon their initial interview with Jean Marc, the last known movements of Celine were passed on and preliminary investigations were started. The police managed to get in contact with Roger Bouvier, who was able to give a description of the truck and the driver. The truck was described as having a white Mercedes cab, which was pulling a Thermo King refrigerated trailer. Unfortunately, Roger and other witnesses had not taken down the vehicle's registration, The driver was described as being aged between 30 and 35, with short fair hair and a cropped red beard. From the descriptions gathered from people at the service station, police were able to generate a photo-fit picture of the driver and this was passed on to all major UK media outlets. The first significant obstacle for the police was that the vehicle had not been caught on CCTV therefore making tracing the driver a lot harder. There were no updates to the media until Christmas Day, when the investigators revealed that they were working on the theory that this driver had abducted Celine. The case was receiving extensive coverage in the media, as there had been a number of similar killings around the English Midlands, which was dubbed the work of the Midlands Ripper. During that investigation, it was the first time in the UK that DNA screening had been used in the hunt for a killer. In this screening program, over 5,000 men had had their DNA logged. 20-year-old Sam O'Paul had been abducted in December 1993 from Balsall Hill, which is the red light district of Birmingham, before being found murdered in the neighbouring county of Leicestershire. A second woman, who was 30-year-old Tracy Turner, had been picked up at the Hilton Park Services, which is on the M6 motorway near Wolverhampton. Tracy was also murdered, and her body was found dumped near the M1 motorway in Lutterworth, Leicestershire. Both of these ladies, unlike Celine, worked as prostitutes. However, their disappearances bore a harrowing similarity to that of Celine. Was she going to be this killer's third victim? By Boxing Day, investigators were working on the philosophy that Celine had come to significant harm at the hands of her captor and the investigation was now heading towards that of homicide. Celine's father, Bernard, travelled to the UK in order to appeal for assistance in finding his daughter. On the 29th of December, Ten days after she had gone missing, there would be a breakthrough. 
The first thing that anyone living in the small hamlet of Horford in Worcestershire knew that anything was awry was when the roar of a police helicopter hovered overhead, shattering the silence of a freezing cold December day. It then descended and landed in a field alongside the A449 dual carriageway, which linked the city of Worcester and the town of Ombersley. The commotion had been triggered when a local businessman had pulled into a lay-by on the northbound stretch of the road at about midday to change a faulty window wiper blade. The businessman, who was not named in any of the reports, then noticed a naked female body in the undergrowth a few yards off of the road. As this was 1995 and there was not as much mobile technology available as there is today, the man had to return home and call the police to report his find. Within half an hour, the lay-by was cordoned off and detectives and forensics experts had arrived. At the time, there were a number of missing females and the first thought was that this could have been the body of Louise Smith, who was an 18-year-old clerical worker who disappeared after a night out at a nightclub in Yate, which is in the English county of Gloucestershire. Upon the discovery of the body, Celine's cousin Jean-Marc made the 111-mile journey north to Horford. On the 30th of December, Jean-Marc formally identified the body of that of his cousin. The nationwide search for Celine Figar had officially ended in that Worcestershire woods. The post-mortem took place later that day and it was established by the coroner that Celine had initially been bludgeoned with a very heavy object which caused a fracture on the back of her skull but this was not established as the cause of death. This was determined to be strangulation. The marks on the body indicated that it had been done with a strap. The autopsy revealed that there were no obvious signs of sexual assault, but it was determined that sexual intercourse had taken place shortly before her death, and when further examinations were conducted, it was concluded that the act was likely to have been against her will. The initial opinion of the coroner was that Celine had been dumped at the roadside no more than 24 hours prior to her being discovered. The initial estimation was that she had been killed four to five days prior. Working backwards, that meant that Celine had been killed on the 22nd of December. Did this mean that she had been held captive against her will for up to three days prior to this? The investigation was led by Detective Chief Superintendent John McCummon of West Mercia Police Criminal Investigation Department. He was described as an old school copper and a straight talking Scotsman. There were two main lines of inquiry for the police to follow. The first being that they had to trace the Mercedes truck with the Thermo King refrigerated trailer which had picked Celine up at Chiefly Services. As mentioned previously, the vehicle had not been caught on the service station's CCTV. The second was two bottles of Pascal Sheraton champagne, which had been given to Celine in France. The reason why the champagne was such a major clue was that this type of champagne was not exported anywhere else in the world. Both bottles were of the 1993 vintage, and that year, only 60,000 bottles had been produced. The investigation team which was assembled was one of the largest ever, with over 100 detectives from three different police forces. Hampshire, where Celine had been reported missing. Thames Valley, which is where Celine had last been seen alive. And West Mercia Police, due to where Celine had been found. Firstly, they were tasked with tracking down the owners and drivers of over 4,000 vehicles, which matched the description of the cab that Celine climbed aboard at Cheveley Services. By the 12th of January 1996, 
DCS McCammon announced that they would be performing DNA testing on all of the drivers that they had been able to locate. The team also sent out over 22,500 questionnaires to haulage companies across the UK asking about their driver's routes on the day that Celine went missing. By the end of January, detectives had traced a thousand vehicles and tested over 5,000 drivers' DNA, but they were still no closer to finding the perpetrator. Whilst the investigation was in full swing, Celine's body was repatronated to France, where her funeral was held at Cessarsun et Saint Albin, which is a small commune in the Bourgogne region in eastern France. The funeral was attended by over 3,000 mourners, which included friends, family, and due to the publicity of the case, French politicians. To further the investigation, West Mercia police reached out to the BBC for the case to be featured on the Crime Watch programme. The search for Celine's killer was featured in an episode towards the end of January. After the reconstruction, the police incident room was swamped with over 600 callers coming forward with information. A lot of the information was not relevant, but two people identified the same man from the photo fit and took the investigation back down to the south of England. The town of Paul is in the English county of Dorset and it is very popular with holidaymakers due to access of the Jurassic Coast with a number of caravan parks and it is also a key spot for recreational sailing. Although the town is famous for its pottery, it is also the home of the Royal National Lifeboat Institute. In the early morning of Monday the 19th of February 1996, Dorset police attended a property on Bournemouth Road in the Parkstone area of Poole. The home belonged to 36-year-old self-employed lorry driver Stuart Morgan, who was originally from Tunbridge Wells in Kent. The key evidence that prompted this visit was given to the police as part of the tip line created after the Crime Watch episode. It had come from a petrol pump attendant in Paul, someone whom Morgan had given a bottle of Pascal Sheraton champagne to, one of the distinctive bottles known to have been carried by Celine. The initial reaction of his neighbours, who were interviewed by the local media, described Morgan as a friendly, decent working man, a really loving man, and not the sort of man to be involved in something like this. Little did the neighbours know that the police's initial search of Morgan's garage had found some of Celine's belongings which she had brought with her from France as well as discovering a blood-stained mattress. Upon searching Morgan's lorry cab, forensic teams discovered droplets of blood in a spray pattern on the walls of the cab. The evidence against him was starting to mount. So what is known about this alleged perpetrator? Stuart William Morgan was born in 1959 and was raised in Tunbridge Wells in Kent. He was one of five children parented by council foreman John Morgan and his wife Julianne, who was a refugee from the former East Germany and worked as a cleaner at a school. In 1974, Morgan was sentenced to Borstal following a burglary conviction. In all of the crime shows that I've listened to, the subject of Borstal rarely comes up, so I'll briefly explain what one is. A Borstal was the name for a type of detention facility for young people in the United Kingdom and the British Commonwealth. Borstals were run by Her Majesty's Prison Services and were approved schools with the intention of reforming young people. They were abolished in the UK in 1982 following the introduction of youth custody centres 
but they are still used in other Commonwealth countries, such as India. Following his stint of incarceration, Morgan attended Croydon Polytechnic College to train as a plumber and heating engineer before running his own business in the Tunbridge area, which eventually folded in 1983. He moved to Dorset in 1983, working as a heating engineer for Bournemouth Borough Council. Behind Morgan's alleged family man facade was a devious womaniser. Morgan had married his first wife in 1982 following a two-year courtship, but when she fell pregnant with twins, Morgan upped and left for another woman. When he moved to Dorset, he met a third woman. I am choosing to leave their names out of this episode out of courtesy to them and their families, but this third lady married Morgan in 1984 and gave birth to a son. Morgan had changed his profession in 1991 to become a long-distance lorry driver. After this career change, his womanising became worse. His brother would go on to say, He has had so many affairs over the years, I've lost count. Following his arrest, he admitted that whilst on the road, he would have sex with many hitchhikers in a year and also admitted to having been in a full-blown relationship with a lady in the Lancashire town of Wigan while still living with his wife and son in the house that he was eventually arrested in. The police were finally starting to piece together a timeline of what happened to Celine. On the 19th of February 1995, Morgan was driving from Leeds in Yorkshire to Southampton a journey which is roughly 236 miles, arriving at Cheveley services around the same time as Celine. Witnesses in the form of Roger Bouvier and another unidentified person stated that Morgan left at approximately 4.30 with Celine on board. His tachograph showed him arriving at Southampton at 9pm, The journey between Cheveley and Southampton should have taken two hours maximum. A tachograph is a device which is fitted to the cab of a lorry which automatically records its speed and distance covered. The tachograph will be important later. Morgan claimed that he had parted ways with Celine at 8.15pm as he passed through Salisbury. Records on the tachograph showed that he had left Southampton Docks and drove a further 244 miles back to Bradford in Yorkshire, leaving Southampton at 9.40pm. During the evening, he was actually pulled over by a police officer just outside of Bradford who wanted to check the mileage that he had driven that day. European Union laws state that drivers can drive 9 hours a day with the ability to extend to 10 hours twice a week as long as they've not gone over the total for the week of 56 hours. As Morgan had not breached this, the officer did not see fit to search Morgan's cab. If he did, he would have likely have found Celine either prisoner or dead by then. Morgan is believed to have kept Celine in his cab on the bottom bunk for the entire ten days that she was missing, often sleeping in the vicinity of Celine's dead body. Throughout his questioning, Morgan kept to the story that he had met Celine and had consensual sex with her before leaving her in Salisbury. Morgan claimed that he picked Celine up and he said that they grew closer as they drove on. Morgan's recollection of events were as follows. I quote, She was leaning across the central console talking to me. Each time we laughed or joked she would touch my arm and leg. He then claimed that he stopped the cab in a lay-by on the A34 bypass to repair his trailer lights. He continued. 
we were drinking our tea and laughing and joking. I said, this will cost you a kiss for Christmas. She laughed at that. We kissed and moved into the centre of the cab. She gave me a kiss for Christmas and it carried on from there. The young lady undressed herself. I removed my underclothing. There was a considerable amount of foreplay and teasing and messing around and then we had sexual intercourse. I never hurt the girl at all. When the girl left me at 8.15pm, we parted ways on good terms. She was smiling and happy. End quote. When he was questioned as to why he did not come forward despite the nationwide search for a lorry driver who had last been seen with Celine, he stated that this was because he was petrified that his wife would find out that he had slept with another woman. The issue for Morgan was that when he returned home for the holidays on the 22nd of December, the police had identified traits within his behaviour which indicated that he may have been trying to make himself inconspicuous. He had dyed his hair and shaved his beard, telling everybody that he had burnt his moustache on a lighter. Due to the size of the vehicle, he had to park it up at the Shell petrol garage across the road from his house. In return, he gave the employees two bottles of champagne. Pascal Sheraton Champagne. In the early hours of the morning, on the 29th of December, Morgan returned to work and prior to leaving removed a fuse from his tachograph so that the journey would not be recorded and made his way north to the county of Worcestershire. On his last journey before Christmas, Morgan had purchased a spade, a hacksaw and an axe in Cornwall with the obvious intent of dismembering Celine but had a change of heart, instead keeping Celine in his cab until deciding to dispose of her on that day. Morgan then made the 47 mile journey to a warehouse in High Urkel, which is near the town of Telford, where he met three men, one of which Morgan knew. This is where Morgan's alibi would come undone however as he had forgotten to replace the fuse in his tachograph, meaning that at the end of the day there was a discrepancy between his recorded mileage and his reported mileage. Whilst at the warehouse, he was seen lighting a fire by his lorry, which he later explained as to having been necessary in order to thaw out the valves on his air brakes. But it is surmised that Morgan used this to dispose of some evidence. Following his arrest, Morgan appeared at Redditch Magistrates Court where the charges were read to him on Friday the 21st of February 1996. Whilst he was waiting for his trial, the police were able through DNA to rule out Morgan for the Midland Ripper case. The trial of Stuart Morgan began at Worcester Crown Court on the 2nd of October 1996. Mr Justice Latham presided with Nigel Jones QC acting as counsel for Morgan and the prosecutor for the Crown was David Farrar QC. The jury was sworn in and Morgan entered a plea of not guilty. Mr Farrar presented first and told the jury they would hear a case of calculated and unmitigated wickedness. He said there could be no plainer case of murder. As the case was outlined in court, Celine's parents, Bernard and Martine, sat at a cordoned off table at the back of the courtroom. The proceedings were translated into French for them through headphones so that they could keep up with the evidence given against their daughter's killer. Farrar presented the case to the jury using the evidence which has been laid out in this episode. He described an account where Morgan raped and murdered Celine on the evening of the 19th of December, then stored her body in his cab for 10 days 
Emperor for disposing of her. The coroner presented Celine's injuries, which were consistent with being battered around the head with a heavy object before being strangled. Injuries on Celine's face were consistent with kicking and stamping. There was also residue on her wrists to indicate that her hands had been taped together. This contradicted Morgan's story that the sex was consensual and gave the impression that Celine had been intimidated into the act. Mr Farrar then laid out Morgan's tangled domestic life as previously described with his numerous infidelities explained in court. The prosecutor also described to the jury Morgan changing his appearance shortly after Celine went missing. The key evidence was, however, the blood spattered all over Morgan's cab with the DNA matching Celine. The two bottles of rare champagne which Morgan had acquired and given to the shell garage attendants and items of Celine's clothing that were found at the warehouse in High Urkel when investigators attended. Examination of the area uncovered a pair of socks which belonged to Celine, a 10 centime coin which was the currency in France back in 1995, a pair of knickers which tested positive for blood and semen and which had been cut, and a bra which had also been cut. Finally, the blood-stained mattress which was found in Morgan's garage on the day that he was arrested. Unfortunately, forensic teams were unable to determine whose DNA it was, as Morgan had doused it in battery acid. With regards to his defence, Mr Jones said that Morgan admitted picking up Celine at Cheveley Services, but gave a warped image of her painting Celine as a druggie and a hussy who had seduced him within hours of their meeting. Morgan stated during his cross-examination, I quote, We talked about her cousin in Hampshire and her family in France, and we shared a roll-up. The traffic was very heavy. I offered her a tea in exchange for a Christmas kiss, and we made love. With all due respect, sir, it made a little noise. I do not remember anything else. Grabbing his notebook, the left-handed Morgan pulled himself together. I left her safe and sound, with cigarettes and chocolates. See, we separated good friends. His lawyer, Stuart Jones, quoted a witness who saw a female in her early 20s wandering around Salisbury. The female fitted Celine's description and was wearing a red beret. Morgan tried to explain that the mattress had become stained with blood because a man had laid on it after gashing his leg whilst the vehicle was on loan to another driver in 1994. Evidence was also given in court in relation to the hole in Morgan's alibi due to the deliberately tampered with tachograph. Ultimately, on the 16th of October 1996, a jury of two men and nine women, one juror having been removed for personal reasons, took three and a half hours to unanimously convict Morgan of Celine's murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with the recommendation that the Home Secretary, the Right Honourable Michael Howard, should decide his parole eligibility. Passing sentence, Mr Justice Latham said, What you did to Celine has caused revulsion in the minds of all right-thinking people. You're a dangerous man and I will so report to the Home Secretary. Justice Latham subsequently set a minimum term of 20 years which was later endorsed by the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, Lord Bingham, and on the 4th of November 1998, the Home Secretary informed Morgan of the length of the sentence that he must serve. 
This would mean that Morgan would not be eligible for parole until 2016. Standing outside of the court, Bernard Figar said, This man will never pay enough for what he did. I hope he spends the rest of his days rotting in jail. To have found him not guilty would have been like killing my daughter for a second time. Speaking through an interpreter, Mr Figar said he could not understand how Morgan could have committed such an act and then pleaded not guilty. Mr Figar continued, Throughout the court case, he looked so detached from reality as if he was a total stranger who didn't really belong there. I just felt sickened by his behaviour. When I first laid eyes on him in May, he just had a blank look on his face and he didn't seem to feel anything or show any remorse. He was just cold. It didn't seem to move him or affect him at all when he heard the graphic descriptions of Celine's ordeal. I wonder if he has any nightmares about what he did to my daughter. How does he feel when he remembers the desperate shout of a powerless victim? How does he feel when he remembers his own hands covered in my beautiful daughter's blood? I never really thought that Morgan would walk away from this, but my real fear throughout the case was that he may have pleaded insanity or diminished responsibility. That would have been all too easy for him. It is beyond my comprehension how a man who has committed such a horrible crime in a moment of madness could have been stupid enough not to get rid of the evidence. Far from that, this monstrous idiot kept my daughter's dead body in the back of his truck with him. What kind of creature is he? Mr. Figar said that he still feels anger towards the second truck driver, Roger Bouvier, who let Celine go with Morgan despite having reservations. Upon his retirement in 1997, Detective Chief Superintendent John McCammon was asked for an opinion of Stuart Morgan. He said, I never spoke to the guy. The actual contact was down to other officers. He writes to me though, quite often, always complaining about something. In early 1998, Stuart Morgan appealed his conviction on the grounds that it was unfair due to the level of publicity the case had received, feeling that he had not received a fair trial. The court dismissed his application for leave to appeal against the conviction. Lord Justice Roy Beldham, giving the judgment of the court, described the evidence against the applicant as being overwhelming, as indeed it was. In January 2009, Morgan appealed again under paragraph 3 of Schedule 22 of the Criminal Justice Act 2003 to the High Court of England and Wales, requesting a review of the minimum term recommendation. This too was rejected, with the opinion being published on the 27th of July of that year. The preceding judge was Mr Justice Openshaw, recommending in paragraph 23, the sentence is and remains a sentence of imprisonment for life. The defendant may not even be considered for release until he has served at least 20 years. That is not to say that he will be released. Indeed, he will be detained unless and until the parole board is satisfied that he is no longer presenting a risk to the public. Even if the parole board decide then or at some time in the future to authorise his release, 
he will be upon license which will extend for the rest of his life. Morgan's parole was rejected in February 2016. When it comes to Celine, however, the local community never forgot. A memorial garden dedicated to Celine was planted at St Andrew's Church in the village of Ormbersley, close to where her body was found. It was opened on the 16th of June 1996. The garden, which was paid for by the local community, raising over £1,000 for the project, was designed by a local garden centre with a springtime theme and will flower every February with white daffodils. Many of the other flowers and plants originate from France. The man who led the investigation into Celine's murder, Chief Superintendent John McCammon, and the West Mercia Police Chief Constable David Blakely attended the ceremony with Celine's parents. Canon Peter Kerr, rector of Ormbersley, said, The garden is visible and lasting evidence of the strong and insistent wish of the people of this county that Celine should not be forgotten. It is also a living expression of our hope that young people from both of our countries should travel and return home safely. So you are now aware of the tragic story of the last fortnight of Celine Figar's life. Before I leave, I want to tie up a couple of cases which I have mentioned in this episode for those who are interested. Firstly, Louise Smith, who the police considered Celine might have been when the body was initially discovered. Unfortunately, she would be eventually found on the 17th of February 1996 in a quarry in Barnhill by two schoolboys who were playing. Louise was walking home from the Spirals nightclub in Yate, which is near Bristol, in the early hours of Christmas morning in 1995 when she disappeared. At one point, 10,000 people were searching for Louise. When her body had been discovered, semen samples were found on her. By March 1997, over 4,500 men had given samples of their DNA in a DNA screening programme. Among them was David Frost, a civil engineering student who had been captured on CCTV outside Spirals nightclub shortly before Louise went missing. Frost had agreed to a DNA test but left for a working placement in South Africa before the test could be carried out the police gained a mouth swab from him in March 1997 and his DNA matched that found on Louise's body. After returning to the UK, Frost was arrested at Heathrow Airport in April and charged with Louise's rape and murder. In interviews with the police, Frost initially denied killing Louise saying that he had met her as she returned from the nightclub disco on the 25th of December 1995. He had left her to walk home after a consensual sexual encounter with her, but later said that he had asphyxiated and strangled her in panic after she began crying and screaming, saying, She was crying louder and louder, and I tried to calm her down, reasoning with her, Then I put my hand on her mouth and tried to stop her screaming. She went silent. However, he continued to deny the murder, saying that the death was unintentional. Frost's trial took place at Bristol Crown Court on the 9th of February 1998 and was due to last two weeks. Frost, however, pleaded guilty to the murder of Louise and was sentenced to life in prison on the first day of the trial. The court heard that Frost had had a non-consensual sexual encounter with Louise, killed her, and left her body on the edge of the Barnhill Quarry. Passing sentence, the judge, Mr Justice Bell, told Frost, 
It was an evil thing that you did in the early hours of Christmas Day two years ago, taking the life of Louise Smith. There is only one sentence for murder, and that is life imprisonment. Frost denied a further charge of rape, a plea which was accepted by the prosecution. He was given a minimum term of 14 years. I have also mentioned in this episode about the Midlands Ripper. On the 3rd of December 1993, the naked body of 20-year-old Samu Paul was found in a ditch near Swinford, Leicestershire, less than a mile from the M1 motorway. Three months later, in March 1994, another prostitute was found dead, stripped naked and strangled. Tracy Turner was found dumped again near the M1, just six miles away from where Samu Paul was discovered. Both murders had striking similarities in victimology, the locations that they were found in and how they had been killed. Police quickly believed both had been murdered by the same killer, fearing that other unsolved female murders could also be the work of the same man. British criminal profiler Paul Britton was brought in to provide a profile of the individual responsible. His profile described a male, very familiar with the area, who was most likely a driver of some form, a manual worker and a loner. The man uncovered to be the Midlands Ripper was Alan Kite, a man who used his travel and solitude along with his knowledge of the roads to abduct and kill the two women. In December 1997, at 30 years old, Kite was arrested for a rape in Western Supermare in Somerset after his victim managed to escape and went straight to the police. As part of this investigation, police took a DNA sample from Kite. Whilst awaiting trial for rape, Kite was charged with both the murder of Tracy Turner and Samu Paul, as the DNA swab matched that to the sample that the police already held. In January 1999, he was convicted of the rape in Western Supermare at Bristol Crown Court and sentenced to eight years behind bars. Alan Kite went on trial for murder at Nottingham Crown Court on the 28th of February 2000. The DNA evidence along with the testimony of a number of serving inmates who told the court that Kite had confessed the murders to them whilst being on remand ensured his conviction. The jury was unaware of his prior conviction of rape and current prison sentence when they made their deliberations. The judge said, you clearly despise these women, but it's also clear that it is you that should be despised. The judge then sentenced Kite to life in prison. So that's it for this week. Please remember, if you enjoy the show, then please subscribe on your favourite podcatcher. If you want to know more, follow us on Twitter at TrueCrimeFixPod or look for our Facebook page, True Crime Fix Podcast. There is also a fan page, True Crime Fix Discussion. I'll be posting information about the week's case on there. I also have an Instagram account, so search True Crime Fix. I usually post pictures with regards to the victims and perpetrators on there. Also, if you have any suggestions or constructive feedback for the show, please contact me at truecrimefixpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, stay safe, look after each other, and live life to the fullest, because you never know who or what might be coming around the next corner. Take care, everyone.